Now Entering is made possible with support from Crossroads Financial Federal Credit Union, Jay County Visitors and Tourism Bureau, Mosier Engineering, Jay County Hospital, Alexander Financial Group, and Jared Clark, Century 21 Real Estate. Hi, this is Mayor Randy Giesman and welcome to Portland, Indiana. Located 90 miles northeast of Indianapolis in Jay County, more than 6,200 people call Portland home. The people who live here take great pride in preserving the past, improving the present, and protecting the future. This is a community that makes things happen together. When they see a need, be it an educational opportunity, or an art center, or even a water park, it gets done. It's a small town with big ideas, evident in the stories of its famous residents. It's one-of-a-kind festivals. It's charitable foundations. Stories told here by the residents themselves, through their own photos and videos. You are now entering Portland, Indiana. Portland is my town because we are a growing, uh, fast-paced community that has a lot of opportunities that just continues to amaze me. You know, we have a top 10 academic school system and we have our own hospital with a wide range of services that they provide. We have uh, this arts place that whether it's music or theater or art, I feel very fortunate that we still have our own radio station, locally owned, and our own local newspaper that's locally owned because I think they're going away in many communities. We have a Hudson Family Park that has an amphitheater, and every summer we have our version of America's Got Talent. We call it Stars in the Park. We have a, a lot of churches that uh, a wide range where the, from the traditional to the very modern and standard that our community goes to. If you asked our community five or six years ago, they'd say, why do we even have an airport? It, it just sets out there and it seems like nothing's going on. And even though there was a lot going on today, not only do we have a fixed base operator that's been there for a long, long time, but we also have your flight training for pe young people that want to learn how to fly. For 53 years, we had just a swimming pool. And two years ago, uh, the park board and the city council and a group of city leaders that we put together uh, did a study, what do we do about this 53-year-old pool? So we came up with a Portland water park project and it will open up this summer on Memorial Weekend and it has something for everybody. You know, Portland is unique because again, they provide opportunities that you would not normally see in a community of 6,200 people. I'm here representing the Jay County Historical Museum and Historical Society. Our museum is located at the end of East Main Street in Portland. The museum is funded by endowments, by our membership. We have uh, probably 700 members and by donations. A few years ago, we decided that as large as our society is and as many uh, problems as there are with keeping a museum like that open, it was too much for one person to be president of the Historical Society. So we have been serving as co-presidents. The Historical Society 
was formed as a continuation of a, a committee from the Jay County Susquehanna in 1967. And then in the early 70s, they were given the use of one room in this building where we're now located. And then in the 1980s, they were able to purchase the land and the building for a whole $1. Uh, and they began expanding into the rest of the building. And now we've had to add on because we have so many artifacts and um, things in the building. There are all eight former high schools represented in the back by school jackets, uh, band uniforms, and then other memorabilia and cases back there. So it, it is quite a large draw. I would say the largest draw we have is for high school. Probably the rarest thing in the whole museum is a two-headed calf. Uh, this calf was born in the New Corden area of Jay County in the 1960s, and it was preserved by the farmer, uh, has since been donated to the museum, and is a big attraction, especially when we have children going through the museum. One of the things uh, that I like to look at is the iron lung. Uh, in 1949, there was a polio epidemic here in Jay County. Uh, there were so many cases of polio that they could not put them all in the hospital. So a polio hospital was set up in the American Legion building. And of course, these iron lungs like we have in the museum saved many, many lives during that time. One of my favorite things there would be have to be the Dr. Gillum room. Dr. Gillum and his wife Jane were close friends to my and my wife Maria. We were honored to be called by his daughter and asked if we would take their collection and set the room up. She painted China, so she wanted it cluttered, just like mother had it, and you remember it, Larry. We said, sure, we'll do that. Fathers where his desk where he worked, we set that up. All of the books and records that he has, every baby he delivered here in Jay County is in there. And when I walk in, I still feel the love of those people and we were so proud to do that room for them. We've had a dream for several years of adding on to the museum because we just keep getting more and more things to display and store. Storage is also a problem for us. Then about five years ago, uh, the Genealogy Society here in Jay County decided to close their offices and ask to merge with us. So we all at once were moving um, hundreds of books and genealogy information into our building, which made us even more crowded. So we finally decided to take the plunge and add to the museum. We started a financial campaign, and by the time the addition was built and completed this fall, we had raised $180,000 through individual and group contributions and two grants that we received for that. It is paid in full. We're preserving the past for the present and the future. That's our goal, so that the future will be able to come in and see what has gone on in the past. And I think it will continue to grow. It certainly has. And so, so thrilled to be part of that. I'm Eric Rogers. I'm the executive director of Arts Place. I've been here at uh, our organization since 1976. I love, uh, love Arts Place, but I also love the people here. I've never felt like a stranger from the moment I walked uh, into this community. Um, and began to meet people, I always felt that uh, I was like a native. I'm Mindy Weaver, and I'm a member of the Arts Place Board of Directors and currently secretary. I believe in the arts, and I like the opportunities that we give to our community. This is a small community, but there are so many opportunities here. Arts Place has, has evolved as an organization and in terms of what we can program uh, over the years. Uh, we're still true to that basic mission of uh, nurturing the creative spirit through the arts, but we're able to do it in more varied ways today than we could initially. But one of them that we, we continue to do that I'm very proud of for our community 
is a program called Arts in the Parks, which started out in 1977. And it's intended to be an, an introduction to the arts. You learn things you wouldn't typically see in a school classroom, particularly then, but it's true today as well. So everything from uh, doing a parade float to um, building your own kiln out of found materials, uh, making ceramics and firing them in a kiln that you've helped build. We bring in great entertainment to our theater and people can come, can buy a season ticket or come to just one event and uh, that's great for our community because an opportunity to have some entertainment here locally and we also attract people from around. One of the great examples of public art that we've been involved in creating uh, here in uh, Portland is the uh, tile relief mural immediately behind me. That's called Landscapes Legacy. And the design was created by Rhonda Franklin, who was an artist working with our Arts in the Parks program in the 90s. And when she learned that we were going to be expanding our facility in, uh, uh, in the next year or two, uh, she said, well, I hope you're going to include public art and it'll be something that will involve the students in Arts in the Parks. Uh, we thought that was a great idea. Uh, so what happened with that program is she and another artist uh, took kids out with pinhole cameras that the kids built. They took images uh, of those and then Rhonda turned that into a, a collage and proposed that we turn that into what you see behind me. That took three summers to create. Uh, first, the design had to be expanded to the size it is. I mean, it's obviously huge. Uh, then the students um, had to learn about carving those images. The simplest things were carved by uh, some of the younger students. Uh, the, anything that's very complex was the older students. The, the uh, college interns were able to do the, the dragonflies and the most complex work was done by Rhonda. One of the things that was missing when uh, I came to Portland was a way for local artists or any artist to exhibit, for people to see what was happening in terms of the visual arts, both for people from the outside and for a local to uh, be involved. And when we dedicated our new facility here in 1983, the, the old part of this building, uh, it was critical that we have that, and that gallery, the Hugh N. Ronald uh, Gallery, uh, is still remembered here today and that uh, that's the name of our gallery uh, now. It's a much greater space. I, I like to just go in there. I, I spend lots of time in there because I get overwhelmed if there's too many things to look at and it's just the perfect size. And we have anywhere from local artists. One event we have every year is we bring in uh, all the area schools bring in their best student artwork and we have a show uh, for that and then we also uh, bring in name artists from um, Indiana and from other places. This is a great place um, to experience uh, different art forms every day. I get to hear students playing, uh, I get to hear adults uh, uh, performing, I get to see great acts that we couldn't pr present in um, uh, 40 years ago. And I also get to walk in and, uh, into this building and see that great mural behind me every day, which I go to look at every day. <laughs> my name's Jack Ronald. Uh, I'm here today to talk about Elwood Haynes, who was uh, my great uncle. He was uh, one of the older brothers of my, grand my grandfather Haynes. Uh, Jacob March Haynes, came out to Indiana in 1843 uh, by uh, horseback and canal boat to Muncie, of all places, uh, where he was going to apprentice as an attorney under a family relative by the name of Walter March. Uh, he, he did that for about a year. Then in those days, that's how you learned the law. There were no law schools. You studied under a lawyer. He did that for about a year, and in 1844, after he passed the bar, he rode by horseback over to Jay County to Portland, where he established himself first as a lawyer, and then was uh, later circuit court judge. Judge Haynes and his wife had uh, 
eight surviving children, six uh, sons, two daughters. And the sons uh, were really different in, in terms of uh, their career paths. There was a banker, there was a lawyer, um, there was one who went to, to Colorado to be a rancher. Uh, and then there was Elwood, who was uh, considered um, kind of uh, different. He was, uh, one of the family jokes was that uh, they wondered whether mom and dad were going to have to keep Elwood at home because he couldn't uh, fend for himself as an adult. The youngest brother uh, was my grandfather, Edward Haynes. Elwood um, had a reputation, according to what my grandfather has written, as being kind of dreamy. He knew all the names of the birds and trees, but he wasn't very focused. And uh, he was, some of his things uh, were little inventions he started that caught fire, that created a certain amount of chaos. Um, but then apparently he found a chemistry book and it motivated him to get focused on um, science and invention. The family sent him to uh, what is now Worcester Polytechnic in Worcester, Massachusetts. Somebody wrote a letter back saying that these Western boys don't do very well uh, at Eastern schools. Uh, he did well. Uh, it was tough. His grade, he, I have letters at home where his, his grades weren't uh, what his father thought they should be. Uh, and he, he was living on a shoestring. He uh, also complains about how he needs a new winter coat in these letters. He comes back to, to Jay County and gets a teaching job at a country one-room school that he had to walk miles to to teach every day. And that lasted for about a year and he was hired by Portland High School. Portland was just then developing a, a high school. Um, about two years later, he was principal of that same school. So Elwood then gets asked by local business people, um, why don't you dump the high school job and become superintendent of the, of the gas facility for us, the local gas company. Um, he did that for a few years and was good enough at it that he got hired away. He was hired by Greentown and then later by Kokomo and he had settled himself in Kokomo uh, by the 18, late 1880s, early 1890s. Uh, it was there that he developed his first car. Uh, it's safe to say that he was an automotive pioneer because there's lots of quibbling about uh, who invented America's first car. Uh, say, you could say Elwood developed the first commercially successful automobile in the United States. They branded it as America's first car. Uh, later, the, the Duryea's uh, challenged that, uh, but the, uh, the Haynes car is in the Smithsonian as, and was for years recognized as the first commercially successful automobile. He also developed uh, Stellite, uh, which is an alloy, very, very strong alloy. It was kind of a precursor to stainless steel and some credit him with, with being one of the developers of stainless steel. Barry Hudson, who's uh, a retired local banker, had always said that he, he wished we had a Haynes car in Portland. Several years ago, I, mean, I guess I'm the guilty party, I was on eBay and saw this beautiful brass era Haynes, a 1910. Model 19, and I went into the bank the next day and, and happened to say, hey, guess what I found, Barry? And he bought it that week. Uh, it has been on display at the Community Resource Center ever since. He told me the other day he, he's always discovering new things about the car. Well, I went to a meeting and the park board was, was having it and they were talking about that they needed some land because they, they would really love to have an amphitheater and a pond. And so, but the, they didn't have any money. So when I went home, I talked to my wife, Elizabeth, and I said, you know, we need to do something to help the park board and the city out because they have no way of acquiring what that they're, they had a five-year plan for doing this. So we went and purchased, uh, we ended up purchasing two houses which we tore down, and then we purchased uh, over 30 acres. And then uh, also, uh, one of the nice things about me, I've been in, in banking for many years, is people call and tell me different things. And so 
I got a call that says the local hatchery uh, was wanting to give some more land. And so we have over probably 35 some acres uh, that made this family park. Uh, my wife and I gave that to the uh, park board with a stipulation that within 10 years uh, that they would go ahead and do what they said, which was build an amphitheater and put in a, a pond. So this amphitheater is just unbelievable. It has all kinds of events in it. But the other good thing is it's called Hudson Family Park. It's not called Hudson Park. And the family thing is <clears throat> because you have children there, you have old people. If you go down there in the summertime, you'll see people pushing the kids in a stroller. You'll see old people and walkers. It's, they've got a, a place there for children to play and they, had, they put a, a field in there of like cork. It, it's just one of the neatest parks in, in this part of the, of the state. And the people use it for weddings. And one of the neatest things that I've ever seen was uh, I like the third world country. And so uh, another local church group, they gathered up and they said, we're gonna have an orphan walk. Well, when you have an orphan walk, you start thinking about how do orphans, how do kids, how do people in third world countries walk? Well, they walk without shoes. The fellow that was in charge, his name is Chris Fenney, and he says, okay, Everybody, take off your shoes. We're going to build an altar of shoes. So he built this altar of shoes, and then everybody walked around. Well, even though it's a trail there, you start walking around there, you find out there's a few stones there. <laughs> so anyway, it was just kind of a wonderful thing. That was uh, tears to many people's eyes when they thought we're walking as orphans do in this park, the Hudson Family Park in Portland, Indiana. The entryway in this park, they came with the suggestion of making a replica of the, the Bow Bridge. We have the only Bow Bridge in the world, and there's a replica of that in the park. And when you're standing there looking at this replica uh, in the entryway, if you look over one way, you'll see the swimming pool. you see the new swimming pool. And if you look over the other way, you'll see what was my old high school. And my old high school there it's the Pete Brewster Field. And Pete Brewster was one of the most famous athletes uh, to uh, graduate from Portland High School. Now, this is before it was Jay County High School. So Pete, uh, well, I always tell Pete, said Pete, I'm your president of the Portland Fan Club for you. But now think of this, Pete Brewster that graduated from Portland High School in 1948, he was varsity football and varsity basketball at Purdue University, a Big Ten school. I mean, this is, the guy was an amazing athlete and he's a wonderful person. When he played for the Cleveland Browns, he, uh, they won two national championships, they called them at that time, because this was before the Super Bowl. But also then he got a Super Bowl ring because he was a coach for the Chiefs in Kansas City. He was the end coach People got together a couple years ago and they named the football field where Pete played and lo and behold, I played there too. Uh, but of course, I wasn't as good as Pete. But this guy, uh, he came back when, like when I was in high school, uh, trained for football, and so we were playing touch. And I know, uh, so uh, Pete was the quarterback of the other team and uh, when we were just practicing because he'd come back and play. And so I thought, well, my coach, uh, Glenn Bryan, had told me, as long as you see the guy's belt buckle, you go for his waist, you know, even though it's touch, you know, well, tackle, you go for his waist. But I, so I, here's Pete's the quarterback, and I'm going right at Pete, and I'm watching his belt buckle, the guy just disappeared. He just, he was so fast, he just moved sideways. I, I, I didn't see it coming. But, so that's Pete Brewster. So anybody that's out there uh, in Jay County, if they're my age or older, if they're 75 or older, especially if you're around in the 80s, if you say, who are the three Bs? I guarantee you, every man knows who the three Bs are. That's Brewster, Bond, and Bright. The 1948 Portland High School basketball team, which beat everybody and should have won in the state. But we always say, 
bad referees and <laughs> at Muncie Central <laughs> beat us. <laughs> so that's the story of Pete Brewster, as you can see, who's one of my heroes. I'm Rusty Inman. I'm the executive director of John Jay Center for Learning in Portland. We're kind of a geographic anomaly here. We're a half hour from everywhere. In order for people to have post-secondary education, if they wanted to do anything after high school, they have to drive somewhere. Well, when you have single parents, working parents, um, you know, a lot of other things like that, that's a big that's a big hurdle and that's a big reason to say no. So if we can take those hurdles out of their way and bring it to them, we're eliminating excuses and it's gonna be a whole lot easier to say yes. The college degrees that you can earn from John Jay Center for Learning, we partner with Ivy Tech Community College, Indiana Wesleyan University, Purdue Polytechnic University, and Vincennes University. All these classes are in-person, for credit classes, no online, no distance learning. They send professors to our building to hold face-to-face -face classes. With Indiana Wesleyan, with Purdue, with Vincennes, it's all start and finish at John Jay. Our focus is lifelong learning at John Jay Center for Learning. We do summer camps for grade school to junior high age kids focused on science and technology. For high school, we have the Learning Annex is hosted at John Jay, as well as the Alternative Placement. We have a senior learning program, it's twice a month. We've had topics from selling on eBay to operating a smartphone. We helped a lady that has family that lives in Arizona. We taught her how to Skype so she could see great grandkids. The shining example of what John Jay is all about. There's a lady that lives here in the community. She was a high school dropout. She was a single mother. She came back, she started in the GED program. She earned her GED. She then started, they talked with her and said, don't stop now. Let's talk about college. So she enrolled at Ivy Tech. She went through the nursing program. She graduated from the nursing program. She's now a, a registered nurse that works here locally, and I mean, that's, that's why we do what we do.